It was a Wednesday. I was walking home. It was April 15th, tax day. And I went to the gym and I uh, it was about eight o'clock, just getting dark. And I was walking from sweat back to my apartment. And, um, you know, my memory's a little hazy of it, but basically a man came up behind me and, and beat me. He came up and knocked me out and um, left me on the sidewalk. That was the most alone I've ever felt in my life, where I'm sitting in this hospital bed by myself. It's 2 a.m. And when something like that happens, it just shakes everything inside of you apart. You're listening to Philly Who, the podcast that tells the stories of the doers, thinkers, and performers of Philadelphia. My name is Kevin Schmidlin, and today I'm talking with Emily Smith. Emily is the executive director of Philadelphia's Magic Gardens, an immersive art environment on South Street that receives over 150,000 visitors per year and showcases the mosaic work of Isaiah Zagar. After spending her early 20s as an artist in New York, Emily came to Philadelphia in 2009, just one year after the Magic Gardens opened to the public. She would get a job there working the front desk, stay for about a year, and then move on to North Carolina. But it wasn't too long until Philly and the gardens called her back. And I get these messages and I'm listening to my voicemails and it's all the staff and they're saying, Emily, Ellen resigned. Are you coming home? She became the executive director of the gardens in 2011. And since then, the labyrinth has become one of Philly's top tourist destinations. In this episode, we'll talk about how, for the first few years as the gardens soared in popularity, Emily's personal art career fell by the wayside. But in 2015, she was violently assaulted and she turned to painting to cope. I started making this self-portrait series and it was so cathartic. It was so incredible. And then I worked through this for the emotional components of it for me and the physical components. And we'll talk about her mission to protect the art of Isaiah Zagar, who, over the past 50 years, has created 220 public art pieces all across the city. When you're talking about preservation, it, it's not just 1020 South Street here at the Gardens. It's, there's, it's, all of, it's all of them. All this and more about Emily Smith and the Magic Gardens, now on Philly Who. Stay tuned. So the Philly Magic Gardens are just the beginning of the legacy of Isaiah and Julia Zagar, who have lived on South Street and influenced the Philly art scene for half a century. And while this show won't dive deep into their story, in this episode anyway, it's important to understand their influence on Emily Smith's story. The three of them, along with the Magic Gardens team, have achieved a pretty improbable feat by bringing the gardens and Isaiah's work international attention and acclaim. When you inevitably see one of Isaiah's glassy mosaic installations around the city, heck, you you could even be walking past one right now, you'll get why they and he are such Philly treasures. But they and the gardens probably wouldn't be as prominently featured in the city's conscious if not for Emily Smith and the work she's done. Just visit the gardens on one of their countless sold-out Saturdays and Sundays and you'll see the well-oiled machine she and her team are. What's most impressive about that to me is that Emily had no formal business or administration training before taking the reins of this organization and growing it to where it is now. Her schooling was totally focused on art, and it was clear that it was already all she cared about as far back as when she was in kindergarten. I remember during recess, the other kids would go out and play, and the teachers would let me sit in a room by myself and draw, which is really bizarre, I think. And I remember working really happily by myself and drawing and drawing and drawing. And then I didn't know at the time that was sort of a special thing. I just assumed everybody got to draw. Yeah. <laughs> like, And that was something that was always a, a huge part of my life. Making art always just was secondhand. That's interesting because when I, my picture of schooling, for better or for worse, is that people tend to be sort of shoehorned into whatever is defined as the rules. So it's it's almost surprising to me that they went that far out of their way to accommodate that. Yeah, you know? public school, man. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It was a, it's a funny thing, and I didn't know until later 
that I had been sort of earmarked as one of those kids that maybe should be fast tracked or something. And my parents, I mean, it's debatable. I think it's good. What they did was they said, you know what, let her grow on her own and, and keep her where she is and, and she'll figure it out. So I think in a way, uh, my parents were very savvy and were very, always very supportive of my creativity, always. So you went on to attend the School of Visual Arts. At that point in time, you graduate. What's your plan? Well, I went to the School of Visual Arts. It's in New York City. It's on 23rd Street. I was determined to get to New York. New York is a pretty tough place to move to when you're 18. Why were you determined to go there? I think in my brain, I felt like it had the most energy. It was the most connected to art, which is, it is true. I mean, it is quite incredible. I probably could have benefited from having more of a normal experience, but not, I mean, of course not, because then I wouldn't be who I was, but it was, you know, New York is very isolating and it's a really tough city to live in. And there's millions of people every day that you pass and you, you're not interacting with them on the same level. But I had some really incredible teachers and some really beautiful experiences there, but it was, it's a tough, it was a tough time. And when I graduated, I had no self-esteem. I rarely do have a self-esteem as it is, but I, uh, I graduated and I thought, you're not talented enough. You don't, you're, you're not going to make it. This isn't going to be a thing that you should continue with. And it was just the, the overwhelm of New York that made you feel that way? I think it was more myself and my feelings that I just wasn't talented enough that I didn't know that this was going to be a really hard row kind of thing. And I kind of committed to having a bunch of jobs to keep my apartment very New York, you know, it's, I have a shoebox apartment that costs $2,000. And I had this really incredible moment that had happened. I was very lucky, but a few months before I graduated, my sister and I went to Italy. My sister graduated her, she got her master's and my parents gifted her with a trip for 10 days to Italy, which was great. And they said, she had never left the country, but I had traveled a lot on my own. And so they said, well, you can go to Italy, Sarah, if you bring Emily with you. And while we were in Italy, we went to Venice and we were in Venice and I swear I got off that train and it was like my whole body exploded. I don't know if you've ever been to Venice, but it's like a dream. It's the most amazing, bizarre place. And while we were walking around, we were just there for a few days, we stumbled upon this museum called the Peggy Guggenheim Collection, and it was Peggy Guggenheim's house. And she has this unbelievable collection in her home in Venice, right on the Grand Canal. And while I was there, we were walking around and I was freaking out. My sister took photos of me because I was like in my sketchbook, I'm writing everything down. There's a photo of me, I look like my hair's all crazy. And, and I noticed that there were a lot of young American women working there. And so I was very smart, and this has happened to me a few times in my life, where you just walk over and start talking to someone and it can change your life. I walked over and I said to one of the young women, how did you get here? How do you have this job? And she said, oh, it's like a, it's a paid internship. You apply. They need American women because Peggy was, not even just American women, but you need, they need Americans because Peggy was an American. And that's part of what their mission is, is to continue this kind of legacy. And I was like, oh man, this is awesome. So... I applied and wrote this crazy letter because I had been there. And the woman who actually picked my letter eventually said, God, I got this letter from you. I was like, oh my God, who's this girl? She's like, a fan. she's a super fan of Peggy Guggenheim. And I, I sort of went back to work, sort of forgot about it, and then got the, the email and they said, you're scheduled to work in like three weeks. Can you get over here? And I had committed to saying, okay, I'm going to be in New York. I'm, this is my life. I'm not going to make art. I don't know what to do. And literally, I had this moment where I said, okay, pack up and go. It was one of those moments that I, you, you just, you're so grateful that it happened to you. I was about a month into this internship. And while I was standing in one of the galleries looking at some of the art, it was very quiet. I thought, oh, I could do this. I should do this. This should be my life. And it just snapped back into place. And I thought, oh, okay, now how do I do this? Yeah. <laughs> henceforth <laughs> so you you in that moment got the confidence that you were lacking when you you know graduated school and, and kind of took on this new life absolutely it was an incredibly introspective moment and it was just a, a little shift that clicked in and it never clicked out again sometimes that's all it takes it's just that the smallest adjustment in in your way of thinking and it totally changes everything and it's just like why not why not do this why why can't this happen to you 
So that was, I mean, the experience was incredible uh, for so many reasons, but that little moment, it never, it just put me down a whole nother road. So then your time in Italy ends, you have this new direction. What was your next move? So I leave Venice and uh, I traveled around a little bit with a friend and then came back to New York. And I had, I had a moment where I came back from New York and it was literally the day I came back. I came home exhausted in this sort of existential bubble of what am I doing here? What did I just go through? And sat on the floor of my apartment and said, I'm out, I'm done. I'm not gonna live in New York. I'm, I don't wanna live here anymore. And that also was just one of those moments where I said, it's too hard right now to live here. It's too expensive. I don't know how to survive here. Yeah. And so that was also it. <laughs> yeah, and, and is that then when you decide, now what, where did you go then from there? I moved actually, I kind of didn't know where to land. So I, I visited a friend down in Austin, Texas. I visited my aunt and uncle in Santa Fe. I was like, I don't know where to live. And a friend of mine had moved up to, or was going to move up to Woodstock, New York, in upstate New York. And he said to me, you know, you should think about moving up here. Why not? You know? And I said, well, it's as good as a place of it. Is any, right. might as well. So I went up to Woodstock and the, the day that I drove up there, I walked into an art supply store, started talking to someone. They needed help. I said, I'll work for you and found an apartment in an old farmhouse and moved to upstate wow. New York. No internet, no cell phone reception, no television. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you learn a lot about yourself when you're reading a lot of books and, right. and not being uh, stimulated by the outside world. One of the things that was really important about that time was I taught myself how to paint, which is funny because I had gone through art school yeah. and I wanted to prove to myself that I could be alone in a room and that I could sit for hours and make art. And I hadn't done that. You know, I was too young. Art school is one of those things that's super intense. And then they so you, you get done with it and you're like, what the heck just happened? The real world doesn't work that way. And you immediately, you, you lose your community. So I wanted to see, is this something that I can drive myself? Can I do this? Will I be happy? Am I, am I able to grow on my own yeah. in this room <laughs> by myself? And uh, I did. I did. I spent a lot of time making a lot of bad art. But at the time, I thought it was really good. Yeah. And it was wonderful. I was working in watercolors, which was something that is a pretty tough medium to kind of dive into. But I loved it. And I taught myself how to paint, really. And it was a lot. It was, I just remember the winter. It felt like it was nine months of winter yeah. and just sitting in my sweater and my fingerless gloves yeah. painting and painting and painting you touch on something so interesting i tell this sometimes to college students like you know college trains you to sprint and then you graduate and it says okay go run a marathon yeah and you're like wait this is not what i trained for right when when you challenge yourself like this was it something that you thought that would be indefinite you're like i'm just going to sit here and paint as long as i can or did you say i'm going to give myself this winter and see what happens you know, I don't think it was quite so thoughtful in terms of my own time. And I've never been that way, which is, I think, one of the great successes that I've been able to enjoy is that I don't have a path. Like, I never set out to be something. And I've just been hopefully either pivoting at the right time when the opportunity was given to me or knowing when to pull back when that happened. When you don't have a set sort of path or, or rules that you're following where you're saying, okay, you graduated from school, now go to master, get your master's, then get your PhD, or you need to get a job or this, that, and that, and then you need to get married and have children or like any of that. When those rules don't apply to you, anything can happen. So, you know, at the time, I don't think I was triumphantly painting and finding myself. I was lost. I was really lost. I didn't know what I was doing. I was working at an art supply store. I was a waitress. I was okay doing that stuff, yeah. but I, I didn't have an end game. I didn't think, oh, well, I'm going to be discovered in my room here in the winter. I, I just was trying to get through the days. And so when it was happening, you know, being in upstate New York, I did have a moment about nine months in where I thought, oh, I, I think I'm too young to be a hermit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too young to do this. 
I think I need other people around me. <laughs> and there was sort of a moment my very beloved grandmother got sick and she lived outside of Philly and we found out that she was pretty sick and I said, well, I'm going to, that this, this seems like a good moment to go yeah. find other people. And yeah, I didn't, I didn't think, well, I'll make it, I'll figure it out someday and I'll be the best painter ever and I'll learn everything. It just, um, it was like I was trying to make a friend by painting and I just was lonely and needed something. And it ended up being really like a beautiful thing that ended up happening. At that moment when you decided it was time to go and you wound up coming to Philadelphia, did you have that perspective that it was something beautiful and, and that it, um, you know, served its purpose or were you just like, I got to get out of here. Oh, I, like, I was whatever. miserable. It was, we didn't even know too, because it was just the start of the recession. Oh, nobody knew what was going on. Yeah, it was, I got here 2008. Yeah. And no, my grandmother was dying. I was a mess. Didn't have a job. <laughs> I moved, a friend of mine had bought a house in South Philly and she said, I have a room and I need people to pay the rent. <laughs> so can you, can you roll on in here and take my room? And so I came, I didn't really know if this was a good idea. I, um, I wasn't super familiar with Philly. I, I had been here a couple times, certainly over the years. I had friends that went to Drexel and all that stuff, but I, I wasn't like gung ho. This is it. I'm finding my, myself. I'm like, you know, blossoming in, into a woman. I was like, a slug that was <laughs> like just kind of I felt like a loser but you know and and then it it shifted and then you know like anything it sort of starts getting better how did it shift well you know I say that it shifted but it took a little while to shift you know again it was the recession and we everyone nobody had jobs you couldn't get a job and so I had all these odd jobs I worked at an ice cream store I uh, was a, an apprentice glass blower, even though I, and I was very sexually harassed the entire time. Um, but you know, it was like, everybody just needed money. You just needed to get by. And then eventually, um, I found the magic gardens actually. And so that was in 2009 and that changed everything again. Now the magic gardens opened in 2008. Yes. So this is just after this opened up. Yeah. How did you discover it? Oh, this is, this is a great story, Kevin. Let's go. That's why we're here, right? <laughs> I saw that they were looking for some part-time, front desk, minimum wage, help us out, sit at the desk kind of thing, take some tickets. And I had all this experience with nonprofits. I had been, you know, I'd worked in Italy. I had so much experience. I was, re I was like, oh, this is the perfect job for me. I love, I, what is this weird place? And I had actually never been inside. And I applied, put my resume in, and I'm, I waited and waited, and it was maybe a week or two, never heard back. I was like, what is this? You know, I am so good for this job. And I, was, I had some friends in town, and we walked, we were walking down South Street, and I said, let's go to the Magic Gardens. I just applied here, and I don't know, let's check it out. So I had never been inside, and we walked through, and it totally, I mean, floored me. I mean, I, re I remember that first visit so well. It was a Saturday, and it felt busy at the time. Now I know 10 years later, <laughs> it was not busy at the time, but we were, I mean, we were just, we were loving it so much and having this great time. And as we were leaving, there was one woman working at the front desk and she was very frazzled. She was alone. It was a Saturday. She didn't seem to know what she was doing. And I thought, okay, go ask this poor woman what you know are you still hiring you had put your you know let's see let's see what she says so i wander over to her and i say hi my name's emily i had applied a couple weeks ago i never heard back i just wanted to see this is another moment we walk over and start talking to someone and she was really sweet and receptive and she said oh i don't yeah let me pull up your resume and it turns out that she was the newly hired director she, someone had called out that day sick and there was no one else on staff. So she, the director, had to come in and work at the front desk, which was sort of a new thing you know, for her. She was, she was fine, she was doing the best she could. And so of course this woman has the power then to pull up our resumes and look at everything. And she said, well, I can't find your resume right now. I, don't, I can't find it here, but you seem so nice. You seem like such a nice person. And I had a beautiful dress on and I was with all these really good looking gay men that day. And it was like, it was just one of those moments where she must have seen something in me. And 
she said, why don't you come in next Wednesday for an interview? Not seeing my resume, not knowing anything about me. And I couldn't believe it. It was one of those really funny moments. And then we came in, I came in on Wednesday and she and I started talking and we like cried during the interview. It was like, what are those? And I thought, oh, I'm never going to get this job. <laughs> I'm never going to get this job. This one's going to think I'm crazy. And then she called me back. So you get this job. And at that moment, like if someone said, oh, what are you doing? What would you have said? At that moment, I was literally front desk opening the door in the morning and taking, it was $4 at the time, taking $4, giving a brochure. We would do some tours. It was really simple back then. We didn't have a ton of programming. Right. At that time, did you think that the Magic Gardens would become the destination that it is today? No. I mean, nobody, none of us thought that. We loved, but we, we loved the space. We loved Isaiah. We loved all, I mean, but I had, none of us had any clue how could we not? I don't know. But none of us thought, oh, this is this is going to be something really, really important. We sort of, we didn't know what we were doing. None of it. We were people who were super thoughtful and lovely, but we were all young. All of us were like mid-20s. Right. So we just were like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll be here. We'll man the station. How long until you became the executive director? It was 2009 when I started here. 2010, I got promoted from, from 2010 to 2013, I was the sort of gallery manager, which was the number two spot. And in those three years, I mean, it was growing so quickly. Yeah. And I held every position, actually, as we were growing. So I did rentals. I did the exhibitions. I did all these other things. So uh, 2013, I had my, I call it my lost year. And I quit the Magic Gardens. After much thought. Yeah, why? I was burnt out. <laughs> I was pretty burnt out. I was burnt out, but I also, I had a girlfriend at the time who had given me a slight ultimatum that was sort of like, if you would like to stay with me, I, you know, she moved to North Carolina. And at the time, I think I was burnt out and I kind of thought, okay, maybe I need to switch it up. And it was a really hard decision to make. It took me a long time to make it. And I thought, okay, well, maybe you need to, to do another adventure. And I left the gardens and went down to North Carolina, which was lovely on many levels and really unpleasant on others. <laughs> and I, um, about three months into North Carolina, I started having dreams about the Magic Gardens. And I started thinking about Isaiah and Julia all the time. And I started thinking about the staff. And we were sort of in touch with each other and I was always connected, but it it felt like this strange, something had gotten under my skin that I didn't even realize. I mean, I would have literally have dreams about it. About nine months into North Carolina, I, I got out of work and I turned my phone on. The reception was really bad at that museum. So I turned on my phone and I had 15 missed calls. I had a ton of messages, all from people from the Magic Gardens. And I thought, oh God, Isaiah's sick or Julie, something's happened. And I get these messages and I'm listening to my voicemails and it's all the staff and they're saying, Emily, Ellen resigned. Are you coming home? Are you going to, can you come, are you going to apply? Can you please? And my friends were calling me. Everybody was like, are you coming back to Philly? Are you coming back to Philly? And I thought, oh my God, what, what's happened? And I actually spoke to Ellen that night and she got another great opportunity. She, um, she works at the Penn Museum now and is doing wonderful things. And so I told her, you know, I'm not quite so happy down here. And she was like, I'm sending you the job description tonight. Like, yeah, please, like, you have to think about it. And I thought about it for two days, really deeply thought about it. And my best friend here, Kay Healy, she's a, a wonderful artist, and she was desperate to get me back. And so she and I were on the phone, and she said, listen, Emily, this director might be the last director of Isaiah and Julia's life, and that it, it has to be you. It can't be someone else. You know, I applied. I went through the whole interview process. It was like a whole thing. It took a couple months and I got the job and it was really, you know, it was really exciting and thrilling. Actually, my, the last interview, I had the full board and the staff and Isaiah in the interview. And Isaiah actually, so, you know, I, I was being very professional. I hadn't talked to anybody during the interviewing process. Beyond, my staff actually interviewed me. I mean, I hired them and it was, right. I was so proud of <laughs> them. I was so you. proud. Wow. I was so proud of them because they did such a good job. 
And so I see, I show up for the interview. I'm in my like button down and my, you know, my power suit and I'm like really nervous. And uh, I, Isaiah insisted on coming up and opening the door and he gives me this huge hug and he said, are you going to come back? And I was like, I, we got to interview me first, Isaiah. It's up to you. <laughs> right. And, you know, even he was, before I had left even, he, Isaiah had been really struggling with some of, um, some depression and even he was coming out of it as I came back. But in the interview, he had said, oh, I'm, I'm thinking of just like giving up or whatever. And I don't know what to do with my studio. And in the interview, I looked at him and I was like, you're not giving up. I'm not going to let you give up. Like, that's not something that's going to happen. I gave my two weeks notice in North Carolina when they gave me the job. And they said, just come up here as soon as possible. I didn't have a house. So Isaiah and Julia were in Mexico. They said, come live in the house. So I put all my stuff in storage. I had one bag of clothing. I had my dog in the front seat, my fish in the back seat, and all my plants. That was my car <laughs> in my grandmother's Buick. And driving, you know, up 95 to Philly, seeing the city, I swear to God, it was like the entire year just slipped off my shoulders. And it was like, oh my God, I'm home. Like, I'm home. What did I, why did I ever leave you, Philly? How could I have done this to you? You know, you're just like... <laughs> Coming back to the warm embrace of a lover where you're like, oh my yeah, God, yeah. <laughs> how could I have forsaken you? And Philly you? was begging you to come oh back. Oh my so. God, it felt amazing. It felt amazing. I was 29. It was two weeks before my, my birthday, my 30th birthday, and I had become the director of the Magic Garden. I mean, it was like unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. At that moment, you felt at home. Philly was always the place that connected the most with me. And that moment, it will, I, when anytime I'm mad at Philly... <laughs> Because we all have relationships with Philly. I mean, it is, it's sometimes an abusive relationship. Usually it's pretty loving for me, certainly. But coming back, I mean, it was visceral. Like it was yeah. visceral. Seeing the city, I was like, I, I yeah. couldn't describe that feeling. It was so unbelievable. Yeah, it, it reminds me, I always, you know, a lot of folks joke because Philly can be gritty, of course, as, <laughs> gritty. which is the favorite, you know, everyone's favorite term, especially these days. Yeah, gritty. Um, <laughs> but I really think that Brotherly love and sisterly affection makes sense because brothers and sisters fight, <laughs> right? Like sometimes <laughs> yes. more more hardcore than anyone else. Yeah. But there's also that that pull, you know, that grounded core, you know, at the end of the day, love for each other, which yeah. is which it sounds like you felt for the city. It's it's such a it's intangible a little bit. It's hard to describe if you haven't lived here. I try to describe it to people. We're full of character, you know, we're we're kind of a mess. But there's something so raw and wonderful happening here that's it's still capable. People are still capable of doing incredible things in this city. It's it's not like a place I've ever been before. And and my life, of course, is very special. Like look, like look around what I get to be in all the time. But only Philly afforded that. You know, only this could have happened here in Philly. I will forever, certainly after leaving, for all of you out there who think of leaving Philly. Don't do it. Well, <laughs> well, or do it and come back you, with love and appreciation. Would you have the same appreciation for Philly if you hadn't left no, for a year? No, I, I think that year was very necessary on, on many levels. But um, I can say that I any of those doubts that I was not in the right place vanished. And, and coming back, I have not felt anything but where I'm supposed to be. So you get to work as executive director. Yeah, back in the groove, baby. Yeah, yeah. And did it? Is that what it felt like when you did it? Feel like oh, just oh, getting right amazing. back into it. First day on. I mean, it was it was so thrilling because you got to remember, I had been here. I had hired every single person on staff at that point. I came in the first day and I sat down and knew the password to open the computer. I mean, it was one of those things where it was like, what are we doing? It was wild. That was a really triumphant moment. And um, I think all of us were, we were so excited that we didn't mess it up, you know, like, and uh, we just, we hit the ground running. We all had ideas, everybody, and, and knowing some of the areas that I think we, we could focus on quickly, just, we, we clicked in immediately. What were some of those ideas that you immediately jumped well, in? Well, one on? of the things like first day, um, you know, we wanted to fix some of the staff hierarchies, you know, we needed to, to make sure that everyone had job, like stuff really simple, not, not sexy stuff, but the infrastructure needed a ton of work. We had a satellite office that wasn't working. We needed to get back on site. We had no air conditioning. We had no heating. We um, had no museum-wide software. So we couldn't, we were selling tickets by hand, basically. We had no information about who was coming to visit. 
There was many, many things that it was just an infrastructure kind of situation. We needed bathrooms. Like we just needed to focus a lot on the facility related stuff. And so we made a list within six months, half of it was done. I mean, we just, we powered through, it was wild. It was like a wild, wild time. So during this time, were you still painting? Oh yeah. After, when I came to Philly, I kept painting. And then I went to North Carolina, I kind of dropped off a little bit. I made a couple paintings, but it was not uh, the most productive time for me. And, and then I came back to Philly and, and worked a little bit, um, but it wasn't really until 2015 that I started really connecting again with art. What happened in 2015 that made you reconnect? Well, you know, 2015, it was a great, it was a great year. It was an interesting year because we were doing so, it was so amazing at the gardens actually. And we had just, you know, we just moved into the office space upstairs. And I had actually, I was sort of in a fight with Isaiah because he felt like I had kicked him out, but that was his idea to move out of that studio. So don't let him tell you otherwise. And I just accepted his invitation to take over the studio upstairs. Yeah. Anyway, so we're sort of in this really interesting time. There was a lot going on here at the gardens. And um, it was a Wednesday. I was walking home. It was April 15th, tax day. And I went to the gym and I uh, it was about eight o'clock, just getting dark. And I was walking from sweat back to my apartment. And, um, you know, my memory's a little hazy of it, but basically a man came up behind me and, and beat me. He came up and knocked me out and um, left me on the sidewalk. So he punched me from behind. He uh, gave me a severe concussion, broke my jaw in two places, uh, shattered my back molar completely, it, like eviscerated my back molar and um, fractured my sort of like sinus area. I, I, I sort of came to, I was sitting on a stoop, a Philly stoop, and there were all these people all around me. And um, what had happened was a young boy, this is such a Philly thing, you know, someone had their window open and heard what had happened. And this young kid, he was 16, ran to the window and said, what happened? And this guy who had hurt me said, she's hurt. And then he walked off. And so this kid calls the police and, um, they were here really quickly. And so I came to, and I'm sitting on the stoop. There's all these people around. You're like, you know, stoop sitting in Philly. You're like, what's happening? This is very surreal. And um, they asked me, what's your name? I didn't know my name. I didn't have any ID on me. I didn't know who the president was. I didn't know what year it was. But actually, I was sitting across from an Isaiah Zagar mural. So I kept saying, I know that guy. I know that guy. And so I'm looking at this mural, and they were like, okay, crazy. <laughs> and I kept saying, I know, I know him. I know him. And what had happened actually, so they picked up my cell phone and they called the last person that I had been talking to. And it was actually my friend Kay, who I've mentioned a few times now. And she was on, she was actually coincidentally on her way over to my house to pick up some keys. And so she answers the phone, poor Kay, she answers the phone and the police, she says, hey, I'm, you know, like just like saucy, like what's up, <laughs> hey. <laughs> And it's the police, and she could see, she was close enough that she could see the ambulances from far away. And she didn't even hear the rest of what they had, she just started running. And she was with her husband, left him behind, poor guy. And um, she just runs, and she's just t tears streaming down her face, because she doesn't know, she thinks I'm dead. She thinks I'm totally dead. And uh, I, I'm sitting on the stoop, and everyone's being really nice to me and everything. And I see the crowds partying and Kay just gra she grabs me. She's like an angel. And, I, and I'm like, oh, Kay. <laughs> hey. hey. And I was like, what happened? You know, she just is like squeezing me. Like I'm going to, you know, she's squeezing me and holding me so tight. And I, I was like, oh, I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing I here? was so out of it, you know. And I was just laughing. And um, I said, I think I fell, you know. And she said, no, honey, you didn't fall. And. So she was there with me the whole time and I, um, you know, I could feel my teeth, you know, and so I was like, are my front teeth gone? And she said that there was so much going on. She couldn't really tell if my teeth were gone, but she was like, no, your teeth look great. Yeah. <laughs> and she said after she was like, oh, I didn't know if your teeth were gone, but I just wanted you to feel good. Yeah. And, and we get into the ambulance and, uh, you know, the, the, we were, I was just really, I was cracking all sorts of jokes. I was, I don't know if you've ever had a really bad concussion, but for me, it was like, I was super drunk. I didn't know what was going on, and uh, it was a really intense kind of 
thing. I just kept laughing. I was like making all these dick jokes and like yeah. to this poor ambulance driver. And and then we get to the hospital. And so, yeah, we found out that um, we're not quite sure what this guy, he, I didn't have anything on me. He didn't steal my phone. They don't know if he like wanted to rape me or what, um, but he just attacked me and then went off. I mean, there might not be a reason at all why he wanted to do it. And so it was kind of this moment. Um, I never had a moment like this before. And, and I think most people don't. If you're lucky, you haven't had, had a moment like this where I was just walking home, you know, just totally. I didn't have a great, you know, moment. Uh, you know, I was like listening to Miley Cyrus, you know, like I was just like not even having a thoughtful moment. And then it lights out like I didn't even know what had happened to me. So if he had come up behind me with a gun or something, like that was it. There's no romantic sweeping moment where you're like, oh, I get to ponder my life choices or I was just lights out. And that had never happened to me before. And so I think right after, and still it, it kind of doesn't leave you or I, I get, you get a little existential where you're like, what is the point of all this? Like, what are we doing? That you could just be walking and for no reason whatsoever, for a really unfair reason, you could just be gone. And that was really another moment that really shifted me. And um, it's funny, I was never, I still, I've never got mad about it, which is something that a lot of people get confused about, but I was always really curious about this guy. Like what, what happened that he did that to me? And I, I've said before, like, I'd love to get coffee with him, which is, it's insane. Of course, I don't want to get coffee with the guy that beat the crap out of me, but I'm really interested in how, you know, society creates a person that can just walk up to a gentle human and hurt her for no reason. And I, I felt like it was important to, you know, while this was going on, it was, you know, the election was starting to like gear up and we were talking about violence and, um, you know, this, this incredible stuff happens in America that is just so intense and so violent and we're seeing it, you know, this is, I was targeted because I was a woman and um, it just gives you a lot to chew on. And a lot of what I wanted to talk to people about was one that experience and also what are we doing as individuals to stop this from happening to the next person when it happens so much, yeah. you know, what are we doing? How are we raising men that they can become this kind of person and, uh, or what are we doing to support people? Yeah. Is it mental health? Is it drugs? Is it just violence? Like, what is it? I got, you know, I had, um, I couldn't eat for eight weeks. And, um, after that I couldn't have my, surgery for my mouth so I had like a gashed mouth until my jaw healed and then I had another two weeks of not eating so you know I showed up to work <laughs> you know like they couldn't keep me away I went I went home for a couple days because I had to and then was was here at the gardens I mean I wanted to be here yeah. that was a tough night because that was the most alone I've ever felt in my life where I'm sitting in this hospital bed by myself it's 2 a.m and it was when something like that happens, it just shakes everything inside of you apart. When you realize something so horrible and senseless can happen so easily, I just, I, that night is a really dark night for me. And then 11 a.m. when visitors start showing up, first two people in my room, Isaiah and Julia, crawled into bed with me, crawled into bed. The next people, the entire staff, all of them just came in. Like shocked, shell shocked, <laughs> but they just, they all came. I mean, this is like when we talk about family and where you want to be when you're hurting, I wanted to be here. How did you feel when you saw all of them? Well, you know, you, my thing, which, you know, in therapy, my therapist is still trying to work on this. So I, I'm trying to always comfort other people when I'm screwed up. I think it was much harder for people to understand what had happened to me. Julia is someone who puts it in perspective. Um, you know, Julia Zagar, who's, she's 78, she's seen the world, she's seen terrible things, gone through terrible things. And it's one of those things when you bring it up, she starts to cry and she says, it was horrible what happened to you. Like it was horrible what happened. And I think that's a moment where when someone else is conveying that to you, you're like, oh yeah, that was really Yeah, bad. holy crap, it was. Yeah. At first I couldn't really work through it. I didn't really know how to. And then I started trying to think about how do you physically convey the emotional yeah. hurt that you're gone when you're when you're so confused and you're feeling so turned around and you're trying to deal with the anxiety i mean still like you know, if someone walks up 
behind you, and, and this is probably with everybody, but if someone's walking quickly behind me, I shut down. Still, broad daylight. I have to like go to the side of the wall. And it's one of those things you just, it's never going to leave you. Your life is altered after that. So I started making this work, this self-portrait series, and it was so cathartic. It was so incredible. And then I worked through those for the emotional components of it for me and the physical components and did it really quickly. And um, Sarah, my my buddy from Paradigm Gallery, noticed my Instagram post or whatever and said, girl, you want to do a show of this? Because this is really great. And um, and then we did the show. And it's actually the, the opening was this cathartic therapy session of strangers telling me their horrible stories. And then the staff coming back and my parents coming and everyone sort of dealing with this thing that had happened. And I think it was really healing. I mean, I think it was really positive. And talking about it helps. It needs, people need to talk about that this happens. Yeah, so the series was When a Man Decides to Hurt You. And you've said many times in interviews how that series, creating that, working through that, and it sounds like, you know, then speaking with others, both, you know, folks who are there to support you and folks who have gone through the same thing, that that helped you process this, that you weren't really able to process this until that. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, I think it was one of the things I I sometimes get pretty tripped up on emotion. I'm one of those chronic feel it later kind of people, you know, and um, I work really hard to try and feel things when it's happening because I really do think it comes back to bite you if you're not really dealing with it. So I try not to be afraid. And one of the things that was very interesting to me was, you know, trying to articulate these very abstract feelings that I was having and physically going through it, I, you would think that it was worse or that I was, it was very empowering actually. And the last painting I did um, was sort of this sort of defiance and this saying like, nah, you didn't kill me. You didn't get me. And I'm, I'm going to be around for a lot longer. And so I think that was really, I finished that painting um, the day of the pulse gay club shooting and that was the morning I finished it and it was also the week of of Brock Turner getting off for raping that woman and it was this moment where I was like nah you gotta fight we gotta keep fighting this is really intense so it was very cathartic yeah so now we're we're talking around 2016 Uh, at this point the gardens is open for about eight years. You're here for seven, pretty much eight, yeah. just say eight. And it's growing incredibly. Now at this point, from my knowledge of someone who hasn't been, you know, intimately involved in the organization, it's, it's on the map, right? At this point, it's uh, top five. When people come to Philly, they come to this place. Right. Even if just for a weekend. Yeah. And through that, Isaiah's work gains popularity as well across mm-hmm. the city. Cause there's what, over 200 different, pieces all over the city yeah there's 220 public sites in philadelphia it wasn't too long until you found out that isaiah's 100 foot mural on the society hill playhouse was in danger when you're talking about preservation it's not just 1020 south street here at the gardens it's there's it's all of it's all of them they all have to be thought about and society hill playhouse was the first blow i would say the first big uh blow where Isaiah had made this incredible mural. It was right here, right here in the neighborhood and um, on an old historic theater. And the owner sold to the Toll Brothers. And um, that battle was already lost by the time we found out because the demolition permit had already been pulled and the building had already been sold. So once that happens, there's no going back. You can't really stop it. So... What we decided to do, we tried to appeal to the owners, you know, could we make another mural? Would you, you know, it just wasn't going to go anywhere. And um, and so I started wandering around and I just, anybody that would talk to me. So I went to the Cultural Alliance. I, I went to, I talked with Jane Golden at Mural Arts. You know, we were just like, what are we doing here? If we're going to be losing these, these public artworks, is there any strategy here? And I went, uh, I had a great talk with Patrick over at the Preservation Alliance, which was a great resource for me. And we sort of brainstormed a little bit. And he was like, you know, the demo permit's been pulled. We can't do anything here. But you can get prepared for the next one. And let me tell you about historic designation. Let's see if that's something that's worth going through at some point. And so we started going to different workshops, my staff and I, to learn about historic designation. We started talking to the Historical Commission. 
this was a year before the Painted Bride even popped up. And so we were already thinking about this stuff. We were thinking about our own site, about the Isaiah and Julia like legacy of their buildings. What, you know, what are we thinking about? The Painted Bride had talked to Isaiah two years ago. Very briefly, they had said, you know, this might be a possibility that we're going to sell the building. Isaiah at the time, you know, he just sort of listened and said, oh, okay, okay. And then, okay, I guess that's what's going to happen. And then the director of the bride left and he started weeping. He just cried and said, what, what did they just tell me? What did she just say to me? I, I don't understand. Are they going to tear down the painted bride? And I was like, not if I can help it. <laughs> and the process with historic designation in Philadelphia, and this is a big problem. And this is something that other cities have worked on. It is something that I think is timely for Philadelphia, but you can go right now and pull a demo permit and it's over. There's nothing you can do once that demolition permit is pulled. I think that it would be really interesting if we could have more of a due process there, that maybe there's a, a waiting period or whatever before tearing down buildings. You know, maybe you have to think about how this is going to affect the community. So you have to start working secretly because if the if the owner finds out that you might try and designate their building, anybody can designate any building. If they find out, they're going to go pull a demo permit and it's over. So the system is sort of, it's stacked in a way that's not super transparent. And we put the designation through and the application was accepted. The bride did not want the designation on their building. And um, it's just really tough because our stance was, how can you move forward and still not destroy this thing? And I think that one of the things that I struggle with is that, you know, if you, if you have two situations here, if you said to me, okay, you got to move, but you got to save the building too. Like, let's get creative. Let's start thinking about that. Let's open up that conversation where there doesn't have to be necessarily this loss. And I think that was a problem for me. The problem is, is that I think we probably could have found a better way, but it was not the conversation that we ended up having. Yeah. I got to say, in reading, reading what I've read about this saga, um, which is, you know, I don't know the whole story. I haven't been involved. Yeah, it's a long and complicated yeah. journey. <laughs> and like tactics aside, like I really don't know what to do with it because, you know, it's, it's such a rock and a hard place. It is. Because, it really is. you know, of course we should preserve this incredible piece of art. It's so huge and grandiose and, and such a feat. Uh, but at the same time, they own the building, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and, absolutely. And even at the same time, you know, what they're looking to do with that money is to bring art to, yeah, you know, to under, shift the mission, yeah, underrepresented areas. So, I, I don't know what to do with this. It's a really, it, I mean, let me tell you, it's been a really tough road for everybody involved. I don't think that there's one right answer there. My, our mission at the Magic Gardens, my job as it's written in our mission, is to preserve the artwork of Isaiah Zagar. I mean, that's in the mission. And so when you can like sort of step back and think about it, what the Painted Bride represents as a building is really important. And I don't think anybody, none of us on, on the Magic Garden side ever said, you know, you can't move forward. Or in fact, we were always saying, how can we help you move forward in a way that you can grow and you can do the thing? Like, how can we all help you without destroying this thing? So how many visitors per day would you say the gardens gets? Um, well, we, it depends on the day. We sell out both Saturday and Sundays. So that's about 900 people a day. Um, it's less depending on the weekday, but we have 155,000 visitors. Last year, we had 155. So for, for all those people who have been here, people who will come here, is there one thing that you think they may not know about the place that you would want them to know? Oh, there's so much. There's so much stuff that people don't know. One of the things that's important to know, actually, is that a lot of Philadelphians don't come inside. It's one of the things when I'm out getting a drink with someone or I meet someone, they say, I'm from Philly. I say, have you ever seen the Magic Gardens? They always say, oh, I walk by, I never come inside. That's chronically a Philadelphia thing. It's really interesting. And um, I think a lot of people might come in and just like want to take a selfie and leave and that's really, they're missing a lot of the juicy bits. So Isaiah made this site never to be public. He never meant for it to be public. And it's really, the best way to think of it is, is sort of this visual diary. And so 
the first time you visit, it's really overwhelming. It's really colorful. It's really sort of impressive in terms of scale and, and all these other things and material. But as you stay here, you start to notice the narratives and the storytelling and the drawings and the funny jokes and the weird things. And there are so many references to other art environments. So this is considered an art environment. It's a genre of art that's very misunderstood. Isaiah has hundreds of names of fine artists, of outsider artists, of art environment creators all throughout the space. There's thousands of pieces of folk art from around the world that's embedded in the site. Most are collaborative pieces. A lot of it, most of it's from Mexico. So, you know, they've had decades long relationships with other artists. So, I mean, it's, it's insane here. I find something new almost every single day, truly. And what I said to you earlier, you know, the space, the longer you're here, it doesn't get smaller. You don't understand it more. You understand it less the longer you're here because it, it gets bigger. It gets bigger. And um, it's kind of unbelievable when you start to really break it down what this one person did. It's, it's insane to me. And I'm here every day. I know them. I know the whole story. I'm in it. And I, it, it blows my mind. If you could send a message to yourself in the past, butterfly effect aside, oh. you know, of, oh, I wouldn't have what I have now. Oh, my God. Um, at any point in time. Yeah. What would you say? I got to say that if I could go back to my 19-year-old self, there is no way you could have convinced my 19-year-old self that this was going to be my life. There, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people say that, but there is, there was not a far, like, that was not even a concept in my brain. Just surviving, you know, at that point. I was so depressed for so long and really struggling and really not, I never thought I would amount to be anything. I didn't think I had anything to offer. And so when you, you know, the whole, it gets better. It's such a thing. It's such a thing. And um, what I try and tell young people is that it's okay if you don't quite know where you're supposed to end up. And it's okay to be lost and find yourself. But then sometimes something wild happens and you have a life that everybody is envious of. And it's one of those things, I still struggle. You still struggle where you're like, what am I doing? Or you get depressed or you're like, oh, I'm a failure. Or I'm a loser, whatever this is. And you have those deep, dark moments still. And then you take a step back and you're like, my, my life is not boring. My life is so interesting and so full of color and what privilege to fight for these weird places and to be surrounded by the people that you're surrounded in and, and seeing these lives around you of older people that have made creative, bizarre experiences for, for decades. I mean, that's inspiring. And I, I wish I could have just gone back and like hugged myself and said like, no, like don't give up. You know, if I had given up then I'd have no idea. Like the best experiences of my life have happened in such bizarre ways just by saying yes to something weird or, or taking that opportunity. And I would have loved to have tried to convince my younger self, like, you gotta just keep going. Talk to me in 10 years, you know? Oof. For more on Emily, you can head to podphillywho.com forward slash Emily, E-M-I-L-Y. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, give us a rating. You can also follow along on Instagram and Twitter at Pod Philly Who. Philly Who is a Q9 production. Music by Lee Rosevier. Podcast art by Lauren Carhart. For Philly Who, my name is Kevin Schmidlin. See you next week.